All right, welcome everyone. Day three of our three days to bigger profits. Find the right products and stop leaving money on the table. And I know I said yesterday, you know, that whole money on the table thing. Uh, you know, it's just really, we know what that means and we know we got to not do it. So I'm just going to keep using it. <laughs> and for many of you, it's a, uh, it's the money on the table. You can put that into a real analogy because your table's probably full of unlisted inventory. Yeah? Um, some of you are saying don't hear anything yet. So if you guys can hear me, can someone give me a little uh, heads up that you can hear me? Should be hearing me now. Okay, most. Okay, everybody's saying they can hear. So, <laughs> wow. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> Woo, the question box just exploded. Um, and let me just mention the question box for those who have not been here the last couple of days. We don't have like an ongoing chat where you can see one another. We do have the question box where you can type in uh, your questions, comments. Um, I can't copy and paste links from here. So when we get to the point where I'm asking for items, be sure you have an item number ready for me because I can look over and see a number and copy that number and then go put it into a browser. So that's real important. Um, we have a, a very, very special friend of mine on today and um, known Kat for a very long time. And uh, we are like separated sisters, although uh, she kind of looks at eBay the way I look at Amazon, so we're, we're good polar opposites with that. But she's going to come on and give you her little tips and tricks and uh, history of how she's done things. So that'll be fun. We'll do that in, in just a little bit. But first, I do see some new uh, faces. Well, I don't see your faces. I see your names on the, um, I have a little list of who's here, and uh, so for those who may not know who I am, I always just think you guys all just know who I am, but I mixed it up a little bit today to have some fun. Oops, I guess I have to show you my screen too. Uh, so I am Danny Ackerman. I am also known as the Danny App. And I have been selling on eBay since 1998, on Amazon since 2003. And when FBA came along, jumped into that in 2012. Here's where I thought I'd give you some fun facts, things that a lot of people don't know about me. And that is that I raised, trained, and raced thoroughbreds and had a very successful business with this until the big dot-com crash in the 90s. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, and so, of course, when that happened, husband's job went out the window, and husband's job was really helping to support that horse business um, because it takes about uh, three three years to get a, a baby from uh, conception to the track and four to five years to really start seeing a profit in a horse related business so we unfortunately ran out of money before we got to that point so sold the horses and I kept the goats that I had as the um, the companions for the horses, which is how the name Utterly Good Stuff came along. A lot of people don't know that. It had nothing to do with cows. It had to do with goats. Uh, I raised and showed Nubian and dairy goats, and I moved to Arizona, was in the top three herds in the state, and I made and sold, sold goat milk, cheese, and fudge uh, because you get gallons and gallons of goat milk when you are raising and showing these dairy goats. And so you got to do something with it, right? So that's what I did with that and made a business of that. And uh, no, I don't have the goats anymore. I miss my goats. I loved my goats. Um, I now, of course, run the Danny app and run uh, Utterly Good Enterprises with multiple uh, eBay stores and Etsy and Amazon and different channels. And I also consult with my husband's company that develops new slot machines. Um, and that's a really fun business. So just a little bit of stuff you may not have known about me. I thought I'd throw that in today. So let's just kind of 
go over some of the stuff we've been talking about. And you know, if you, we had some great aha moments yesterday. And I was wondering if uh, that was from day one. And I was wondering if you, anybody had anything really cool that kind of struck them yesterday as we were talking about research and pricing. Something you either are already doing different because of it or you're going to do different because of it. I would love to uh, hear those if you just type those over in the question box. Uh, so we talked on the first day about Amazon sourcing and covering retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, using liquidation sources, wholesalers, manufacturers. I mean, there are as many ways to find inventory as there is inventory out there. It is, it is such a plethora of opportunity for product. And I think sometimes that actually can be a detriment to us because there is so much choice. And, um, you know, sometimes when we have too many choices, it's, it's hard to decide. And customers are no different. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that again in a minute. Uh, but then we talked about research, Amazon research, using the Amazon Seller app, using the Amazon Flow app, um, and just kind of using those free apps that are out there. While there's a lot of pay apps out there, um, you know, I didn't want to get into the specifics of those because I really want you guys to know the basics. Because when you know the basics and the information that you really need to know, then those paid apps actually make a lot more sense and you realize that information they're giving you. And you know what? I question the information on those paid apps sometimes too. So always know really from a business standpoint your profit margins, your return on investment, and where you want your average selling price to be. Okay. Um, of course, then we talked about eBay sourcing, which is better known for thrift stores, yard sales, auctions, estate sales, and consignments. If you don't have a lot of money to put out there and you want to get some good quality merchandise, consignment can definitely be a way to go. Researching eBay using the eBay mobile app, using just eBay sold items, and Google. I love Google. And then we talked a lot about profit margins, focusing on a niche, higher margin items, fast selling multi-quantity, and raising your ASP. And I'm seeing some of the comments come through, some of the big ahas. Um, niche is your big aha. Jackie, that's exciting. I, you know, I, I say it a lot. I mean, I've been talking niche for, for years now, uh, and really it wasn't as important even two years ago, it wasn't as important on eBay as it is today. eBay is, has really gotten to be a funny creature when it comes to the search engine. And you can list different items, but if they're not hot, hot, going to sell right away items, then bam, they're going to lose focus. Um, Cassini's not going to want to bring those up, and they're going to sit there and wait until a customer happens to, to chance upon it, as opposed to, you know, being niched, having that specialty store where you, everything that you're marketing out there is driving customers that are not going to just come in and buy one item or one thing that you have for sale. They're going to love everything that you have for sale. It's all going to kind of connect with them. Uh, let's see, love to learn more about wholesale. Wholesale, you guys, is really, really a huge opportunity, and every single one of you has that opportunity. Um, you need a business license, a tax ID is really helpful, and um, different, different manufacturers and distributors and wholesalers have different requirements, but it's not too hard to get these days, not like it used to be. Some of you are ready just to jump into Amazon. That's exciting. We just did a course over in the Danny App Academy called um, Growing Your Business with Multiple Channels. And we covered Amazon, Etsy, uh, your own website, um, and then some of the other smaller ones. We didn't spend a lot of time on things like Bonanza and, and those because really I, I think if you're expanding and you're going to another venue, you need to go to the next one that has a really big chance of paying off for your extra time. 
Great, Teresa. Keeping it simple when researching. Yes, yes. As I said yesterday, the five-minute rule, and we're going to demo that today. Like I said, there's items that um, I've got a couple submitted, and of course, during the course of this, when we get into that, um, if you have an item number ready, let's go for it. Let's go look, and we'll, or um, if I could figure out a way, let me think about that. I've had some pictures. Uh, if you can describe it well enough, and I can pull up, you know, an example. Like if you have a brand name of something, we can do it that way without a picture right off the bat. Um, if it's like some obscure antique that needs identification, I would have needed the pictures beforehand. But we can play with that. So have you got the Amazon Seller app? Yay, yay. Awesome. Some of you found some new little sourcing opportunities you hadn't thought about. Great, 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 great. Uh, Cassini is the name of the eBay search, and it's the it's the engine that runs the search engine. Is I guess the best way to call it. It's it's the software uh, that runs the whole thing. I did a whole um, video about that. That's out there somewhere. I'll have to find that. Having fun, working on that niche, great, 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 great. Planning on buying replenishables, awesome. Replenishables can definitely make you a lot of money. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, good question, Ron. Primarily in four niches, do I detect? Do you recommend a store for each one? That's really going to depend. Do they connect in any way? Is there some way we could fuse the marketing together? And that's something we could look at as um, as we go today. If, you, if you're willing, we can kind of see if they connect or if they would need their own store. All right, so there's a, okay, starting to submit there. Got a list of ASD vendors. ASD was the big trade show here in Vegas. Great, plan on looking at the clothing and accessories vendors. You have huge opportunities there. Um, hey, that's a good question. Let's hold that question, Tabby. In fact, I'll ask uh, Kat. She can be either, either she knows the answer or she can be looking it up. Um, in, before we bring her on, uh, is there a way in the Flow app to just show the FBA sellers? Because oh, and she saw the question, so she she might already be answering that for you. But uh, we'll have her answer that live as well. Um, what should be on your screen right now? You should see where it says recap profit margins. Focus on niche, higher margin items, fast selling, multi quantity, and raise your ASP. That's what's on the screen right now. Yay, signed up for Amazon last night, listed your first item. Excellent, excellent. Great, Joe, you've got your research time to down to 15 minutes. Hey, I'll take it, I'll take it. That's down from two hours. Just think, that's an hour and 45 minutes you just got back. And that's an hour and 45 minutes, depending on what your time is worth. Let's even, let's, let's just figure and I cringe at this, that you're valuing your time at only like $10 an hour, that's it, you just paid yourself 15 bucks. No, wait, did I do that right? An hour and 45 minutes. No, you paid yourself like 18 bucks. <laughs> Don't ask me to do math. So that's awesome. And as you value your time more, that's a huge, huge raise. Huge raise. Great, great, great. All right, awesome stuff, you guys. Do, 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 do. kind of skimming through. There's a lot of stuff here, and I don't want to spend too much more time on this because I want to move forward. You guys went out. You found some awesome stuff. Great, great, great. Okay, so let's, let's pop forward. So let's talk about pricing. We talked a little about pricing because pricing and research – go really closely hand in hand. So we talked a bit about this yesterday, um, but let me really dive into what my head does on pricing. So for me, there are customers out there in every possible niche you can imagine that 
want to pay more for stuff. They perceive the value in the price. And two of the exact same item side by side, one priced at $10, one priced at $100. If that is the customer that really values the item based on price, they're going to pay for the $100 one because they don't want the $10 one. And I know if you come from a frugal background like mine, I was a single mom, you guys. I couldn't afford to do anything extra. I had to pinch pennies. I couldn't, you know, spend the big bucks on anything. I had to shop at the thrift stores for, for the clothes that, on my back, you know. So for me, it was a really, really hard concept to get. I really had to retrain my brain on the thinking that, Every, I, everybody shops, you know, looking for the lowest price, right? Because that's sometimes what we think. We think that, you know, every customer out there is like us. And I will absolutely 150% assure you that is not the case. Uh, I have been pricing this way, oh, golly, for about the last 10 years now. And even, even when the economy was tanked, even when we were in the lowest of the recession, my sales were still good. And that's because people who have expendable income keep getting expendable income, of course, unless they lose their job. But there's always those customers out there, while they may be looking for bargains, their idea of a bargain is way, way different than our idea of a bargain. I mean, we're out there looking for clearance. We're looking for things that we can turn around and resell, right? So we're, we've got an eye for cheap, but there are customers out there who don't want cheap. So that is my thing, encouraging you to really strive for those customers who are not pinching pennies, who are not worrying about, you know, spending $50 on something that kind of strikes them, it's emotional, and they just want it, right? $100 items, $500 items. They are out there, and they are out there in a big way. It, it, huge amount of, of people out there. And it, I just see that I forgot to turn off Skype, and that could be really bad. <laughs> so I am, excuse me, one moment, you guys, while I make sure that uh, we don't get any surprise calls during during this webinar. Yeah, usually I usually have my little checklist of things to do, and turning off Skype is definitely one of them. All right, good. We're good now. <laughs> okay, some of you were teasing me, but you should have called. All right. Uh, so I'm always, always encouraging, look for those customers who are not shopping on price. I sat down and had lunch with a, a friend who just, he happens to be a multimillionaire. And he, I, we became friends because uh, I, I got connected through my husband's company. He is one of the um, vice presidents there. And um, he found out I was an eBay chick, and he's a big eBay buyer. And we just got talking. And it turns out he let me pick his brain a little bit. And the first thing I asked him was, when you're looking for stuff to buy, how do you sort? And without flinching, he says, oh, highest first. And then he explained exactly what I just told you. He says, you know, it's just quality sellers price their stuff where it should be. Quality and quality sellers, what I mean by that is that you have confidence in what it is you're selling, that it is something good, that it is something desirable, and it's worth what you're asking for it. People with money value that, okay? So they will, they will spend, spend, spend. And let me tell you something else about those customers. They are way less likely to complain. They are less likely to want to return something. They are less likely to nitpick little things about the item because they aren't having remorse over what they bought. They are not wanting to be bothered. They value their time. So uh, 
you know, they're not going to spend that time to return it and ask for a refund. Yes, women do that too. Absolutely, they do that too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Customer service, including free shipping, um, including, you know, expedited shipping, all those things, that's value. That is value of time for, for someone who really values theirs, okay? So you have to consider that in your pricing. And again, I'm going to say what I said yesterday in that you can always price high and come down. But you can't start low and go up once you've sold the item. You can start low and sell the item and keep turning merchandise. But again, you've got to look at how much are you paying yourself? How much work are you doing? Because in the time it takes to sell 10, $10 items, you could have sold three $100 items which is going to make you more money, okay? So let's talk um, a little bit about those different models because in some instances, if your niche is a customer base that you know is a frugal shopping customer, you do need to be sensitive to that. So you do need to consider, um, in the case of one of my apps, his business model is uh, that people are buying parts to repair expensive equipment. So what that says to him and what he knows to be true about his customers is that they are too cheap to just go out and buy the new piece of equipment. So he has to cater to that. And so he has to keep those parts in a range that they are really in line with his competition so that they come to him and keep coming back to him. So that's a case where he can't price, price way, way on the high end because he'll lose his customers because they are not those customers who have a lot of money. They may be customers who are servicing the customers who, who have more money, but that's not his customer. Um, another uh, instance would be if you are selling um, liquidation type stuff on eBay. You know, say the box got damaged or something and this is like your, your clearance center, then you need to price like a clearance center. You need to be aware of that. So that is a whole different customer. So I'm not saying every single thing needs to be priced high. It's just that that, that is my preferred business model as you're looking into getting into a niche um, because the other ones, they do, are a little bit more time and labor intensive. Now, even my, my friend Matt, who has the parts business, he's not spending a lot of time on preparing those items for sale. And his, his cost of goods is ridiculously low, so there's a lot of pure profit built in. And he sells the same types of things over and over and over again. So that's a great business model. Um, when you're doing liquidation and you get, you know, the item like maybe one time over and over, it, it, you have to do more work. So if you're selling it for under, you know, I, I'm like under $15, I start getting worried about you guys. Because unless you can do mass quantities, you're going to be in trouble. We're talking, you know, Walmart. We're talking big lots. Though There's a lot that goes into them making only pennies per item. Um, and they sell on volume. It's all about volume. Like a penny bookseller on Amazon. You know, everybody goes, well, how do they make any money? Well, because they're selling, they're, they're doing quantity of sales, and they're making money on that shipping, you know, reimbursement that they get. But they're not making very much. What's the most they could be making? Maybe a couple bucks a book. So you have to sell a lot of them to make the money. So just always think about that with your business model and how much money do you really need to make and work backwards from there and see what makes sense. Now, I absolutely am a fan of doing promotions and things that bring your customers in to buy more. What I will warn you about is running a constant sale. I see sellers who the sale is always going. There is no incentive for anyone who is, has 
followed or favorited that store or comes back and looks, they're like, oh, you know, they're always running a sale. Uh, there's no urgency in the buy. I can come back anytime. Okay? So you want to be careful about strategically running sales, strategically running markdowns. And here's how I do it. So we have things called long tail items and short tail items. Long tail means there may not be somebody sitting there waiting for you to list that item. It's got to sit a little while and wait for the right person to come along. That's long tail. Then you have short tail where it's a hot item. Those are like trendy items. Um, those are the items where you have to like jump in while it's hot, you know, be competitive, or just something that, you know, somebody has just, they're watching for those listings to come up and it's just kind of a sure seller. So we have these two things and you want to have a balance of those in your store, okay? Because long tail items are going to take longer to sell, so the more long tail and the less short tail, the more inconsistency in your sales. Whereas if you have the balance of both, that's going to really help in the consistency of your sales. Now, when I say long tail, I am not telling you guys to hold on to that stuff for five years. I know there are there are sellers who do it. I know. I scold them every day. <laughs> You've got a real estate investment in the stuff, number one, and you have to pay taxes on that stuff every year. That is an asset of your business. And we're not going to get real deep into that. But um, that, is, that is stuff that is just not doing any service for you. My rule of thumb is a year. A year. Because if it has not found the right buyer in a year, unless it is something that is really, really amazing and is, you know, it's worth, you know, $5,000, $10,000, and it's going to pay me to sit around a while, I'll hold on to those for a while longer. Um, but for the most part, it is, it is out the door in a year, one way or another. So here's my strategy. I have a category in my store, and I recommend you all that have eBay stores do this. My category happens to be called Special Values. You can call it clearance. Clearance rack is a good one for clothing because the clothing buyer understands what a clearance rack is. Um, you can call it whatever you want, but it, it is your place to send those customers who are looking for um, a deal. And so at the six-month mark, thereabouts, I go through my inventory. I sort my active inventory by uh, date listed. And I look for all those things that are at least six months old. And I do this once a month so that each month I'm moving a new group of things into the special values. So I move those things into special values. And you can bulk edit and just change your second store category to do that. And now I run my markdown on that category only when I run a sale. And you can choose. I mean... You can start with maybe a 10 or 15, maybe even a 20% discount. And, and here's the thing by pricing high. This is where it all comes together. You've already priced your items knowing that at some point if they don't sell, you're marking them down, that 10, 15, 20%, right? You've already got the cushion built in. So that now when you put them in there and you run your markdown, you're still realizing a good profit margin because you've built that extra 10, 15, 20% into the price, but now you've sparked a little trigger in those value shoppers. You're going to go, oh, oh, now it's on sale. Now I can buy it. Um, and depending how bad you want to get stuff moving, heck, you can do a 50% off. Move it, push it through, because the idea is to get that stuff sold, get that cash flow back in your hands, for new, better, fresh inventory. And that's how you keep moving it. That is how big retail moves it. That is why you see clearance racks. That is why you see big sales. Because they really have to move the merchandise a lot quicker than, than we do. They don't have the luxury of holding on to it and storing it and waiting. It's got to get moved. And they do that in much the same fashion. 
They have a time period where it gets moved to the end cap with clearance and gets a markdown. And after that, it goes to a liquidation purchaser, um, which a lot of you can buy from and then turn that stuff some more. So that's kind of how the cycle goes. Um, I found out from Tuesday mornings, I love Tuesday mornings, one of my favorite places. Tuesday mornings is already a clearance store. They've already gotten liquidation from um, stores like Bed Bath & Beyond and um, I can't even name some of them, big stores that need to clearance their stuff. So they send it to a store like Tuesday morning, buys it from them. Now they discount it off of the retail price. And then Tuesday morning has a rule, uh, it can only sit there for one year. And I found out that one year is the marker. One year, now they mark it down and put it on their clearance. So now not only is it marked down from the full retail, it's marked down from the markdown. And so that's how they keep going. Uh, yes, I do. I keep the best offer and free shipping on there when I mark it down. I absolutely do. Uh, because the goal is get it sold. The goal is get it sold and I want them to have every opportunity to, you know, if they want to come in another $5 cheaper, so be it. I will take it. Absolutely. Some stuff I break even on. Some stuff I just, you know, make $5, $10, but at that point the goal is to get it sold and move that money into fresh inventory. I don't change the prices. I just I just do the markdown sale. Remember, it's all about time ROI, so I want to spend the least amount of time editing, and moving something into another category is fast and easy. Yep. All right, so someone who knows a lot about this long tail, short tail, Amazon, eBay, has been doing this, I think, I think as long as I have too. Um, you know what? I've never asked her, so we're going to ask her. Miss Cat Simpson. Oops. There's your slide. <laughs> uh, can I bring my bell? <laughs> oh, oh of course you can. So for I those have to bring who, my it depends bell because all my answers are it depends. And for Hi, those who may not know you, can you just give a little bit of history about how you got started online and? Um, how you got, just just tell them the story. Oh, tell them the I would story. Love um, I got started in 1997, so you were wondering when. That's the year that I bought my first thing on eBay. Um, I'm one of those people in the black trench coats buying Beanie Babies in the parking lot of the Hallmark stores. Do you all remember that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm an accidental entrepreneur that kind of backed into a business uh, backwards and found it. Um, I've sold all kinds of crazy things on eBay. Uh, currently, in the last probably 2011, about 80 to 90 percent of my sales are happening on Amazon FBA right now. So I'm still trying to get all of my Amazon stuff backlisted on eBay. So my store on eBay is pretty sad right now. It's got very few items in it, Danny. You mm -hmm. wouldn't be happy with me. <laughs> yeah, but your Amazon is going crazy. Yes, it is. It is. That's why I can't seem to find mm -hmm. time for both of them. So tell them about, because the thing that you sell that I just absolutely like, you have a completely niche store that's, that's shoes and uh, boutique style hand creams, correct? Yeah. Yes, and when I first started trying to figure out my niche, I looked at the items that I was selling via wholesale, and I had three lines of products. And it was stuff that I had found because I just love the product so much. And they were selling on eBay, and they were doing really well. And I looked at those three products and what did they have in common. And the interesting thing was every one of those products was invented by a woman. And every one of those products was something a woman would use. There were uh, luxury hand creams. There were these really cool shoes that are interchangeable. And there were these really neat hats for people in winter weather that had a long hair and had a ponytail. And all of them were invented by women, and all of them were used by women. So I decided to build my business around that cat by women and for women. There you go. So we talked, and you weren't with us yesterday, we talked a lot about how the niche does not have to be the product specifically, but can be the target market. 
Yes, yes, and that's how I've kind of evolved it because I, you know, it's that's a very limited niche. You know, what products are invented by women, created by women, for women. Um, so I started adding things that those kinds of people that were very aware. This is a buyer who really cares about where the products came from. So mm -hmm. I started looking into products that were that were you know manufactured in the USA or created you know a certain way because my audience is women or people that buy for women who really care about where it comes from and how it's made and they're they're not into plastic and they're into, you know, higher quality stuff. That's awesome. And I still, I need a pair of those shoes. I'm telling you, you need to be marketing <laughs> to me more because I really need a pair of those shoes. <laughs> Danny app, uh, the Danny app uh, logo on a pair of shoes. That would be cool. I so, I so need that. Yes, yes. So. Doesn't you need that, like, a pair of shoes with the Danny app logo on them? I think that'd be so cute. Okay, well, we will make that happen. I love that. <laughs> So let's jump, oh. let's jump back a little further because one of the stories for you that jumps out to me, and now this would be, this would be a customer who would absolutely have nothing to do with shoes and hand cream. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's talk about bugs. <laughs> you want to talk about roaches? Really? Let's talk about roaches. <laughs> Well, the uh, the roast the roaches story is another cool story from eBay, and this is why I have two stores. One is the niche store, and one is that everything else. And it comes from my my children. My boys, my two youngest boys, were teenagers, and they were having trouble finding a summer job. And so we looked around. And they said, "Well, how can I do what you do, Mom?" And this is a story about how you really can sell anything on eBay. Uh, Jonathan, my son, who had uh, liked liked bugs and creatures, he started selling lobster roaches on eBay, and that was his summer job. And I think he ended up making about six or seven hundred dollars that summer selling roaches on eBay. <laughs> that is so crazy. That is so crazy. No, but I love it. I know. I had a real man. <laughs> I had to warn my mailman, I said, okay, the boxes make noise, and it's okay, yeah. And then his brother, my other son, who was really into plants, he sold pond plants that summer. So, yes, they were roaches, and the roaches were feeder roaches. Patricia's asking, what were they for? Mm -hmm. They weren't your everyday household roaches, but it is kind of a funny story that they're called roaches. Jonathan had a bearded dragon, uh, which is a lizard and he had a tarantula, and they ate crickets, but the crickets were getting really expensive, and so I said, Jonathan, go research on the internet and see what else we can feed these things, and he found this one special breed of roaches called lobster roaches, and Danny, they don't stink. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so we started breeding I, these roaches in a gallon tank, and then we started selling them. Uh, the, I, you are a better woman than me, because I just, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Oh, we had the deal, though. I didn't have to touch them. You know, I helped him create the list. He had to count them and put them in the little containers we had for them. Oh, goodness. Hey, Melissa's saying <laughs> she sold fake dog dew to Australia in the past. And you know what? There's a, there's a big business in all of, what do you call that? Oh, the, the word just. The, nope. uh, oh. Oh, don't you hate that when you like a word? But all that that gimmicky stuff, you know, the playing tricks yeah. on people stuff. What do you call that? Right, promotional joking. Oh. Bob is in here. Bob probably has a good word for it. Ah, can't novelties. Be. Good word. Gag gift. Thank you, Wendy. Gag gift. Thank you, Suzanne. Oh, gag gift, Wendy. I like novelties too. Novelties for your luxury buyer who's spending twelve dollars on the dog poop, and gag gift for your your budget buyer who's spending six dollars on the dog poop. Right, Danny? Exactly. When people are looking <laughs> for fake dog poop, I can assure you, it is just not about the price. <laughs> But, you know, it really does point to the bigger cool thing on eBay. You know, you can sell anything. It is the world's garage sale. It is a great place to have a really narrow niche and show those people that they can get the stuff they're looking for on eBay. Yeah, so so let's talk a little bit about, um, you say niche, I say niche. Um, <laughs> um, I also say niche. Well, that, there's the luxury buyer, too. <laughs> there we go. So let's talk about niches as it relates to Amazon a little bit. Can we do that? Sure, sure. You know I like Amazon. How much I do you want to talk like about? Amazon? So we don't generally think of Amazon as a niche place, but um, and I don't want to get real heavy into this, 
But let's touch a little bit on the possibilities of what can be done with a niche on Amazon in the way of like a private label. Exactly. You know, Amazon, and, and I've taught this, and you and I both kind of agree, it's really not about the niche, generally speaking, on Amazon. It's like having a Walmart. You can sell dog poop and you can sell luxury hand cream on Amazon, and the same customers won't realize you're selling both, so it doesn't matter. The exception to that is if you really are building your own brand, and you'll hear people talk about private labeling or importing from China, which you don't absolutely have to do to do a label, but that's what you'll hear it called. Um, and it's basically building your own brand. Whether you get the products from your backyard manufacturing it by yourself, whether you import them on, on boats from China, or whether you have a little welder shop in your town that they create a product, as long as you're, cre you're the one creating it, you're the one behind it that thought it up and, and created it and labeled it, then that's your private label. And when you order something from Amazon, you generally speaking as a third-party seller, you can't advertise to those. Those are Amazon's customers. That's where eBay has it all over Amazon as far as building a customer list. Mm -hmm. But the little bitty exception that you can kind of squeak through is what you just mentioned, private label. Because if I buy some Kleenex from uh, Amazon, it might be delivered from you, Danny, if you're selling Kleenex. It might be delivered from Wendy if she's selling Kleenex as a third-party seller. But when I open that box and turn it over, it's going to say Kleenex.com on the bottom of the box, right? Mm -hmm. So Kleenex gets to advertise their brand because they're the manufacturer. So if I created a brand in my backyard or my little town in Arkansas, and it was that cat brand, then all of my products could have thatcat.com on the product. And that's where the, the niche market, the niche marketing comes in um, if you want to try to do that on Amazon is having your own brand. Yeah, and, and I tell you guys, that's where it really is, in my opinion, of really, you want a mega business, you have to have a brand. I, Amazon is great, send stuff in, send stuff in, but at some point, whether it is Amazon or eBay, and it's being controlled by a big corporation, we are out of control of our own business. So, and my appsters know I'm really, really big. Get your own website. And then you use Amazon and eBay and Etsy and all these places as distribution channels and ways to further your own customer base. Absolutely. And I would tell them again, Danny, use Amazon as a testing ground. Amazon has a huge customer base that's very, very loyal to Amazon. If you're trying to find your niche or you're trying to figure out what products you want to create a brand with, test them on Amazon. You couldn't get a better testing ground. See if there really is a demand out there. Mm -hmm. See what words your audience responds to. Amazon has all kinds of ways to run ads. They have all kinds of data to show you how many sessions you had on that product. Um, you can really use Amazon, and you know, you and I both teach people. You know, do you? Oh, Kat, you work for eBay? No, eBay works for me. Mm, so we exactly. don't allow the marketplace. There you go. We don't allow the marketplaces to use us. We use them to build our businesses. And Amazon's a great place to test your marketplace. Absolutely. And so, just as we get ready to wrap up, kind of here. So you got asked, what is your ASP on Amazon? I know we asked Robert that yesterday. So what is your ASP or your average selling price on Amazon, Kat? Interesting. You should ask because I just checked that a couple of days ago, and it was hovering right around twenty-eight dollars. So I would, you know, higher the ASP, the better, is my opinion. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So the thing is with ASP is knowing your ASP is important. But what exactly your ASP is isn't as important as checking it again in a month and hoping it goes up and working to making it go up. <laughs> so you don't want to go low, but the main thing about your ASP is to keep moving it higher. Absolutely. So um, we are going to move into kind of going through and researching and pricing. Are you able to stick around if we get some Amazon-related okay. products? Absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. So, three hours from now. Cool. See, we're just going to hold her captive and, and bring her back and as needed. So thank you so much, Kat. And where can they find you? Thatcat.com is the easiest place to find all my properties. Absolutely awesome. And you might have noticed Kat's over there in our question box actually answering some of those questions as we go. She's much better at, at multitasking that than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yay, and I'm sure she will be happy to continue doing that, too.
Absolutely. You can mute me if you hear my typing. I'm trying to be quiet, but my nails click. Okay, I will do that, and I'll, I'll bring you back on if we have a question for you. Thank you, Kat. Clicking me. I don't have nails. I don't have that problem. <laughs> All right, you guys. So this is something I have never done before. I've, I've never done it live anyway. I do a lot of helping uh, people find their niche, kind of looking at a store and seeing where that niche might be lying that can be built on. Uh, is there anyone, and I'm going to kind of put you guys on the spot, is there anyone who would like us to take a look at their store and, and say, uh, you know, what the heck is my niche? I don't know even what I'm looking at. Um, okay, Alex, what is your store name? We can do that. Let, just go ahead and tell me what your store name is. Remember, not a link, just your store name, so that I can go pull that up and we can all see it. Um, one Apple Hill. Let me go see if I can pull that up and then I'll show you guys. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you my screen again here. So, Alex, I would actually say you, you're you working towards a niche. And I know you're, you're one of my appsters, so we've been working on this a while. Um, what specifically are you thinking is, is not niche? Where, what is the struggle? Give me some specific questions. And while Alex answers that, so before I even scroll down to her merchandise, so let's just ask this question. What do you guys think? As you see her header pictures, all this, I mean, I love this. What would you think that you would find in this store? Mm, interesting. Alex, they're saying beach stuff, handbags. Ooh, they're typing fast. Let's see if I can keep up. <laughs> um, there's a lot of you here, so there's a lot of answers. Quality beach clothing and accessories. Beachy clothes. Designer clothing. Clothing. Beach apparel. Um, home decor. Beach stuff. So beach stuff is a big theme there. Upper class, resort wear style. Ooh, very interesting, Megan. Um, so Alex is going for mostly the preppy coastal feel for her clothing. Now, I am not a connoisseur of clothing, so please forgive me if I don't quite know what falls into that style. Um, so with Alex saying that, do you guys kind of get that feel from this? Wealthy. Oh, when you think coastal, you think wealthy. Very good. Mm -mm. I like that. Okay. So that's something to look at. So that wasn't that wasn't kind of the feeling they were getting right off the bat. So um so that is the Ralph Lauren Vineyard Vines Lily Pulitzer. So let's go down and look at the merchandise. So now you get somebody over here and they come down here and they start looking. Um I'm thinking you you're doing pretty good with this niche. So what specific what is specifically concerning you about um, whether or not you're niched and how that's falling in? So you've got some stuff in there you're just trying to get rid of. Oh, looks like summer. Summery. Hmm. Um, does it seem like you have too many things that aren't clothing? So the store name doesn't say that it's just clothing. So remember, you are going after a customer who's kind of that wealthy, coastal, um, 
um, uh, you, you told me the word and I'm already forgetting it. The preppy, preppy. Is preppy still a word? Do we still use that? I guess we do. Uh, so that's the that's the customer you're going for. So of course they buy other things other than clothing. So if clothing is your mainstay, just be careful as you're putting other things that aren't clothing that those things are still appealing to that person. So I would probably say things like the craft things are they that to me kind of just doesn't feel like it fits in there. Um, you know, plates and kind of things, maybe not. Artwork that kind of fits in that, yeah, I would leave that. Um, but just really watching those things that are not consistent. So those things that you just really want to get rid of, let's talk about those. So what's, what's an item that you just, like, want to be done with and get out of the store? Give me an example, and we'll look at if you're working effectively towards making that happen. All in all, I think you have a very nice store here. Um, it is just fine-tuning even more the plates, okay? So it's even, it's just fine-tuning even more, and, and this is the hard part, because I know it is hard to let go of stuff, and it is hard to pinpoint focus, but I am going to guarantee you the more you are willing to really, really only put things in your store that appeal to a certain customer, the more sales you will get. I see this over and over and over, but it's that jump, it's that, that feeling like we're costing ourselves sales if we do that, that we're costing ourselves those potential customers if we do that. It's the opposite. It truly is the opposite. Your sales will go up. So, so let's look at the plate. You want these out of here. So this is where we're going to look at um, pricing a little bit. And let me just pull up another eBay screen real quick. All right. Okay, these were... Johnson Brothers Staffordshire Bouquet Plate. So we're going to go over here, and this is how I do my research, guys. So Johnson Brothers, what was it? Staffordshire Bouquet. Notice here, this is exactly how people are typing it in here. So um, Alex did her homework on that. Good job. So we pull it up. I'm going to look highest first. Now we've got a whole bunch of, I'm just going to put plate in here because we're only worried about the plates. So we've got 70 results, and was this just one or was this, is this a single plate? It looks like it, huh? Okay, it's a single plate. That's probably going to be a tough sell. Um, if we go down, that's three, five. Oh, there's one. So like 1999. Okay. So now I just want to go over and see what they're selling for. I see what they're listed for. I see what's an average range. Now 26 of them here. That's five, six. See, nobody is selling just a single plate. So the bad news here is if you really just want to get this out the door sold, you're going to have to really come down on the price. That's two. Here's a single, four with $15 shipping. So it looks like people are willing to pay about $20 for this plate with shipping and everything combined. You've got yours at 16 So it's, it's not that it's not priced right, but it's because you just have one plate. You're not driving anybody else to come look at this plate, and this is a pretty highly competitive plate. This is something I would consider going back to the thrift shop, um, seeing it has some crazing and a chip. So for me, in sticking true to your niche and valuing your time, this would be out the door. Don't even mess with it anymore. This does not fit your ideal customer. If you were selling dinnerware and you could use this as a loss leader, I'd say put it at auction for a buck ninety-nine. 
and let it drive traffic to your other listings. But this piece can't serve that purpose for you. So this one is just, it's just costing you time and money. Going tomorrow to the thrift store. Yay, there you go. Hey, and you know what? You put enough of these little get rid of things in a bag and you have a savers, you get a coupon. So <laughs> my favorite. So yeah, this is this is just one of those times where it's an item that you're not it's not worth your time to draw more traffic to it to get it sold. If it was a hundred dollar plate, we'd be having a different conversation. Okay. So did that help? Alex, get a little more. I, I think you're really on the right track with your niche. I don't think you're far off at all. It's just fine-tuning it more and more and getting the marketing behind it. Okay? Um, let's see. Let me go back up here. A couple other people had. Let me find. Let me find who is next. Uh, let's see. Holly, let's do yours. Riddles and Biddles. Riddles and Biddles. Let's go see if we can find a niche for Holly. Let's see. Let me make sure I spell it right. Riddles and Biddles. Okay. So we have Holly Store, Riddles and Biddles. And so the first thing, and I would encourage all of you, especially if you have the new store look here, is get some graphics up here. Get something that really is going to talk to your ideal customer um, because that's the first thing. That's why we talked about on the, um, on the last one we did, what was the feeling you got when you go in there because that's the feeling you're your customer is going to get when you go in. So try to get some graphics up there that pull the right emotion and set your customer into the right frame of mind to buy. You know, if if I went over to a store that I was looking to buy, uh, say, some expensive glass, and up at the top maybe they had a picture of a, you know, a shoe and a a dog or something, I wouldn't get a really good mindset about what I was going to find, right? It's it's kind of like when we were using the analogy of the Mercedes dealer and the Volkswagen dealer. Customers kind of have a mindset of what they want when they go out to shop. And the more that you can cater to that little mindset they have, and they come in and they go, ah, oh, I am in the right place. I'm going to spend some time here. As opposed to, and you can see, this is what's above the fold. When somebody goes into your store, this is the first thing they see. They've got some featured items, and then they've got your top graphics. And you want those to really grab them and compel them to look further. Okay? So let's see if we can find a niche for Holly. So we've got a little bit of everything it looks like going on here, but I'm already kind of seeing a theme of things. So I'm looking over here, 78 mugs, books, 39, cats, donation. So in this, I'm, I'm guessing that this is some, some charity items that you're working towards. Um, and you do, so there's, there's charity things here. Uh, homeschool. So I look down here now, uh, and I'm not sure what's in other yet. Um, vintage isn't necessarily your focus. Sewing definitely isn't. Holidays definitely aren't. Your focus looks to be really on those those mugs and books. So then I would look at how can the mugs and the books play together. What can make your store really interesting for somebody looking for mugs? And let's just look at the types of books that you have real quick. Children's books, it looks like. Lots of children's books, mainly. Let's see. I don't know. Sorry, I had to fix something over here. So, um, dun, 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 dun. So there are things that aren't children's, but it looks like the majority are children's books. Am I right on that, Holly? What do you enjoy? 
what do you enjoy of, of let's just stick and look in the books for a minute. The types of books that you're listing, what are you motivated to list more of? Because where I'm going with this, there's something to, say, you know, drinking a nice cup of coffee or tea or for kids it's hot chocolate and reading a good book, right? You only sell books because they sell. So I would look to look deeper into the books that sell and see where you're making the most money on books. Maybe books need to go. Maybe that's not an area you need to go. So let's look at your mugs. How are mugs doing for you? Mugs are the type of item, I will tell you, people buy them personally to use, but the types I'm seeing here and what I'm thinking more is they buy them to give as gifts. They buy them more as a fun thing to put on their desk. Um, they're buying to add to a collection. These are not just, I need a, a mug to drink coffee from. So start thinking of that customer who is buying the fun mug. Okay, they're, they're, if their purpose is to buy a gift, then the other things in your store could also be those gifty type items. So you're making your money on mugs. Mugs are incredibly easy to find as well. A relaxation station, I like that, Laura. So if I were you, I would look a little bit closer at how you could really turn the mug selling into a niche uh, because mugs sell, you know mugs sell, you're, you're having success, you can pick up mugs for, you know, a quarter, 50 cents, a dollar all day long, I don't care what thrift store or what yard sale you go to, you can find cool mugs and once you become the mug specialty store, shoot, you can add things like um, specialty teas and specialty coffees, what are people putting in mugs, give them some bundles to buy some little gift basket sets, exactly, um, and just be the place that everybody comes for, for that special mug. And that can be an incredible niche because now when they need something, a gift, they go back, oh, you know, that mug store I went to, oh my gosh, I found the greatest thing. They took care of me. It came with this little, you know, blue tissue paper on it so it was ready to give as a gift. Whatever that is, you can make a little signature thing with your branding, and boom, you've got a niche. Does that help? Awesome, awesome. Everybody buys mugs. If they don't buy them for themselves, they're buying them as gift. Like I think everybody buys mugs. You could also really find wholesale sources for, for mugs and sell the same one over and over and over again. Uh, there's a lot you can do with a mug shop. And if you've got already success, you've already got, you know, Google indexing love with mugs, oh, my goodness, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and if you're not making money on the books, yeah, ditch the books. Ditch the books, you guys. There's no shame in ditching something that's, you, maybe you've got a pile of it that's unlisted and you're feeling bad, well, how long are you going to keep that stuff weighing you down, really weighing you down? Because that's what it does to us. We say, oh, yeah, I just got to get rid of that last stuff. Yep, it'll, it'll cost you more than it'll make you. Um, so she says, I didn't really want to niche mugs. I've wanted to use mugs as my stepping stone to a more vintage niche. What do you mean? So, so here's the thing, guys. You have to look at, number one, what are you able to find readily around you? What's, what can you source? If there's something you want to transition to, then moving forward, only start buying those items and putting them in your store. And at the point where you have enough of those items to start deleting items, then start moving those and moving out those items that no longer make sense for that niche. Okay? I don't want you guys to just ditch everything and, and move to something else. You can make a transition.
And of course, we can talk more about that over in the Facebook group. Okay, so I know sometimes it's not as hard to find the niche as it is to get over some of our thinking about the products that that we have listed and unlisted. Because if you have a lot of inventory and you're thinking about, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with all that? It can be overwhelming. It can be a daunting task. And I got to tell you, this is where Dawn comes in really, really handy. Is um, She is the declutter queen. And what I mean by that is that she can look at those items from an unemotional point of view and help you make those decisions that make sense and how to get the processes in place to get that stuff moved out and moved away from your life. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is pricing, something too low. And let's see. Uh, Okay, I have a couple items that were submitted that we're going to take a look. And I can't remember if they thought they were priced too low or too high. But either way, uh, we are going to look at those items. If I can get my screen to pull back up. So uh, let's pull up an item. Oops. Oh, goodness. You'd think I'd only started typing on a computer yesterday. All right. Okay, here we go. We have a pair of boots from my good friend Linda. And these are, you know, I always love it when you guys give me, like, the really hard name things to say. I'm just not going to do it, okay? I'm just, I'm not. It's Etienne. I, I'm sure there's some fancy way to say that. Boots. Boots. There we go. They're boots. <laughs> Really cute. So something to remember is in, and I know, so I apologize. If you are on the East Coast or in the Midwest and you still have snow, I'm just going to, I'm just going to apologize up front as I refer to spring being here and warmer weather. Because <clears throat> in my neck of the woods, that's what we have. So it's, it's my point of reference. Um, generally speaking, boot season is over. Um, so boot season, you're not going to get top prices right now in the U.S., but, 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 winter is starting elsewhere in the world. So first of all, make sure that you are selling international because while we may be putting the boots away, I believe in Australia they're starting to pull them out. So still all good. So let's take a look. So I'm just going to take this maker's name and the boots. Now this says they're Gretchen knee-high shiny patent leather. So patent leather. Okay, I'm going to just take some of these words into note, but this is the main thing I need to know right here. That, that, and you guys are trying to help me pronounce it. <laughs> I just, I just get, what did it say? Anye? Anye? Is that what it is? Okay, I'll take your word for it. All right, so I'm going to go over to another screen over here. I'm going to go back up here. Oops, sorry to make you guys dizzy. Let me just go put that in because I first just want to see how these are selling. And I need my little list view. Now remember, I am sorted highest first. Ah, always sort highest first. Love it. Okay, so we've got 145, but those sold in December. You got some February 10th. You know, I'm not even looking at the style right now, although I do want to just stick with women's. Okay, we are in women's. Good. Um, and because we're looking at used shoes, now when I'm doing clothing and shoes, I do want to specifically look at like for like. That's important. So we got like 85, sold in February, 82, different, 75, 75, 81, 89, doo, 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 doo. okay. So I would say um, you could bump these up. If your ideal customer is somebody who is looking for quality based on price, um, from what I'm seeing here, they're paying 80 plus for these boots. 
pretty easily, okay? Um, your price isn't bad. I wouldn't say you're underpriced substantially. You're still saying these are quality for the price. Let me just try putting in the Gretchen just to see if that is a specific customer likes those Gretchen boots. So here's Gretchen's 35. Now that was underpriced. I, I think they could have gotten way more. Um, do, do, do. See, you've got sellers willing to sell things for 99 cents. You can arbitrage right on eBay. We didn't even talk about that, you guys. <laughs> so let's just go over and look at actives. So as far as Gretchen boots go, and what's concerning me is that yours are not coming up. Hmm. So that could be why these might not be selling. Why are your boots not coming up? Interesting. You guys seeing that? So for some reason, Cassini is not pulling her boots up into the list. And that could be where the problem is. So that's where we'd have to problem solve is why. And this happens. I'm going to tell you guys, this happens more than you ever want to admit. Oh, did I screw up? Yours are new. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. My bad. Okay, well, that would be why the big. But there is going to be times when your items are not going to pull up in search. So I still want to make that point. So that is why it's important that when you're listing new items, that pulls the right customer in to find the items that you already have listed. Okay. Oh, this is better. So in the Gretchen boots, yours are the highest. You've got best offer. This is just slightly below, and the shipping's broke out, and it's not as good of a picture. So I think you're okay there. And we're still – so it's up to you um, how quickly you want to sell these, Linda. Um, I'd probably leave them where they're at. I'd probably leave them where they're at because you've got the make offer, you've got great pictures, and your price is right. It's not too low. It doesn't say, hey, there's something wrong with these. Uh, they're new in the box. You could bump them up. If, if they're not selling, bump them up 20 bucks. Bump them up 20 bucks. It, it couldn't hurt. Couldn't hurt at all. See, so yeah, hey, I told you guys I was going to just do this live on the spot. Oh, it's a little attention to details. I'm so glad they do show up. So, and Linda is, has been working on who her customer is. She is going for a higher-end customer. And only because I absolutely know that, I would probably say go ahead and bump these up 20 bucks, Linda. Leave room, because when you're doing make offer, and remember this, guys, when you have make offer, don't price them at what you hope to get for them. Price them higher. Leave room for the offer. So if she prices these at $89.95, there's a greater likelihood somebody's going to come in at a $60 to $65 offer. Okay? Got to play those little little games there. Um, so do, 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 do. Okay, let's look. We've got a piece of Murano glass to look at. You know I'll always look at Murano glass. Uh, and again, if you guys have any Amazon pricing questions, bring those too, because we do have cat here still. Okay. So this ended with no bids. Okay. It was run on auction, and it was run on auction at a very big price. So you knew you were putting it out there big, right? Never hurts to test that. Never, ever, ever hurts to test that because it only would have taken. Now, I have to ask you, though, you've got a reserve on this. Would you not have been happy with $1,000? And um, Laura, this is yours, right? You would have been happy with $1,000, right? So be very, very careful about putting reserves on items, you guys. If you're starting at a high price, leave the reserve off. Because I can tell you right there, $999 with a reserve, you're going to get somebody going, eh, why bother? You know, if I can't win it for $1,000, I'm not going to bother bidding. Now, if you just started it at, you know, $995, the reserve would make sense. And you could still have people 
coming in on it. But that was probably the little mistake made there. Um, so how many views did you get on this? See, that's another thing you need to look at. And you researched for days. See, we don't want you doing that anymore. So here's how I would have researched this item. Let's just do that. So Murano glass. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, blue heron bird. I'm going to take some of that off in a second, just for purpose. This is how I would have started that search. You knew it was Murano glass, and you knew it was a bird. Okay. Again, I'm going to price by highest first. So as I'm going through, and because there's so many results, I'm going to go straight to the solds. So what I'm going to do is go through um, and start taking some things out that it is not. Now, I don't take things out that I'm like, if I'm not, well, it could be, you know, is it a Telma so boozy, blah, 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 I don't know. Uh, so I'm not going to take that out. But what I would do is take out things like, um, oops, oh my goodness. Okay, so, and this is a good key for you guys too. You can minus words. So it's not free form, okay. Um, it is, I am pretty sure it's not um, Alessandro Payanon. So I'll just take out his name. So now that's going to like, look, it brought me down to 1163. Uh, so now I can kind of look down, and I'm looking, seeing what's similar. And it looks like, you know, even the birds, they're in like the $300 range. So let me ask you this, Laura, how much do you have into the item? Because that's really important in determining how much you're going to sell it for when you don't know. up the bigger picture so everybody can see the bigger picture. I mean, it is nice. It is absolutely a nice piece. Um, to me, it looks like it's in the Seguso era, just because, I mean, I just happen to know that for you. So see what the bottom looks like. It's got a couple little tiny little mixings on it, nothing, nothing too major. Okay, so you, you've got quite a bit into this. Is this something you bought for your own personal collection? Okay, so you, you paid retail, right? And you knew you were paying retail when you bought it. So this is the type of item, um, if you're really set on getting a substantial amount over the $1,000, this is the type of item You've got an emotional attachment to it. You paid a lot of money for it to begin with, so it has value to you. So in that case, price it at a price that is going to give you some room to come down on a best offer, um, but not make you resentful if you have to come down, you know, at least 20, 25 percent. Does that make sense? So in this case, you know, you paid 800 for it. I'm sure you want to get your money back out of it. Uh, so I probably have this priced in the, you know, 15 to 1800 dollar range. I don't think it's bad. I would not do an auction. The reason why I wouldn't do an auction is you need that special buyer, and you need a buyer who, when they find it, they're going to grab it. And so I would do this at fixed price with best offer. Let them come in and make you an offer and, you know, do the free shipping for the added value. And, and But that's what I would do with a piece like this. So you weren't way off on your pricing on it. It's just that auction was the wrong format for this. Okay. Um, I have a couple of pictures. Let me see if I can make this work. So we've got this lamp that is made of ebony wood. So what do we know? We know it is an ebony wood lamp. And we know it's ebony wood because that's what the person who sold it to us has told us it is. Um, so we have a carved ebony wood lamp. So let's go over. I'm just going to go here because I'm already sorted correctly. So we have an ebony wood lamp. 
We start the research there. Three results, none of them look like what we've got, right? So let's go see what is currently listed. Not the same, not the same. So what I might do, just because I'm not seeing anything that matches, is go, now let's see what an ebony wood statue sells for. Similar, right? So wow, they go all the way up to $5,000. That's pretty cool. Let's go look at solds. And we can see people will pay a substantial amount for an ebony wood statue. So I would make a decision based on that information, based on it being a really unique item. I would probably price this, and especially I know whose item this is, and their ideal customer is a, a home interior decorator type. So I would probably price this in about the $499.95 range with best offer and free shipping. Because um, I'm guessing this person did not pay, you know, more than 20 bucks for it. Uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but there is 30. See, I was close. I was close. Um, so there you go. You know, it's a nice piece. It was probably a statue made into a lamp, which may or may not affect the value, so you have to be ready for that. So if I were to price it at 500 somebody comes in and makes me an offer of 200 am I going to take it? My appsters already know this, but absolutely, you guys. So now when you're listing these higher-end items for these big prices with these big margins, guess what? Those low-ball offers aren't so painful. You can take those low ball offers and make huge, huge profits. Okay, we have time for, um, let's see, you know, we're running a little over you guys. Let me see, got it, see where we were with this. Um, so we've talked about pricing too high. Um, we've talked about pricing too low, and I just want to see. I didn't even follow the PowerPoint; just kept going. So, so who is just still really, really, really confused about this? And just the your store just isn't making sense, or you your pricing. Or, Throw those kind of questions at me right now. Let's cover that. I don't want anybody leaving here confused. Susan, let's see. Um, you asked a question here. Let me see if I can find it. Listed an item on Amazon app yesterday off another seller listing and underpriced to be lowest. Okay, let me bring Kat on to address this because this is an Amazon question. So let's help Susan with this. You there, Kat? Hey, yeah, I saw Susan's question. I think she did the right thing. Um, if you're, especially if you're an FBA seller, <clears throat> pardon me. So let's, you can let's say what that thing was because everybody couldn't see her question. So she says she listed an item on Amazon app yesterday off um, another seller listing, which is how you do it on Amazon, underpriced it to be lowest, and the item sold for $199.99. So regarding the price, is this how it's done, or should I have priced it lowest 225 and waited. Interesting, this item has been on eBay for three months at 189.99. No buyers. It's on Amazon four hours and sold. Just sold the second one just now on Amazon. Your thoughts on pricing below lowest price would be helpful. Oh, well, I'm glad you read it out loud because I misunderstood it when I first looked at it. Susan, congratulations. <laughs> An item yeah. that hasn't been selling and she's moved it. That's awesome. I would keep upping the price depending on how many of you have. I try not to be the lowest price on Amazon, um, especially if you're doing FBA. Your prices can be higher than somebody who's using Merchant Fulfill, which means you ship your own items versus ship it into the Amazon warehouse. So you've got a built-in uh, benefit right there. So I price 10 to 15 percent higher than the lowest price. Um, if you've sold one at 199 and then sold another one at 199, I'd list the next one at least at two you know, maybe 210. Um, just keep stretching that boundary until you find the sales velocity you want. I mean, if, especially if it's something you can keep getting. Yeah, and, and here's one of my little, my little sayings, too. So in this particular case, you flipped it quick and you netted um, 68 bucks on this item. 
So that was a really healthy profit margin in there. Um, if it was a lower priced item, we might be going, mm, really going in under, but you got the quick sale. I mean, there was a timing thing there. You got a good profit. So uh, that goes to my saying, can't go broke making a profit. You know? I was just thinking that. Can't go broke making a profit. Congratulations. Great sales. Yeah. But if this was like a 1999 item, I'd have been going, ooh, that sold a little too fast for, for my taste if everybody else was above that. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my sound is cutting out, so I can't tell if you actually um, – Ask me a question or what? Sorry, Danny, my sound just went oh, out for a few seconds. And you're fine. You're fine. Um, so I just want to address a little bit the race to the bottom on Amazon mm -hmm. and what that looks like and how you have to be careful of that. You want to talk to him about it's that for a second? Sad. Yeah, it's very sad because you'll find a product like Susan's great product that's selling at one ninety nine, and somebody else will find that inevitably, and they'll say, "Oh, that's great! I can sell it for one seventy five and still make money." And the next person sells it for one seventy two, and it goes down and down and down until there's no profit to be made. It's a pretty predictable cycle because there will usually be people out there willing to make less money than you. That's why you have to constantly be sourcing new products. You can't just sit back with the ones you have. That said, um, don't follow that. Don't do that. Value your time. You know, sell the product for as much as you can get and still get the, as many sales as you want per day on that product. But at the same time, as the price, if you see it's going down, it, just stop using that product. Move to another product. Again, come back six months later because we both know that a lot of those people that are chasing those sales to the bottom are not making any money. And when they finally realize they're not making money, they'll be gone. So a product that's not profitable anymore and you have to stop selling it, boo-hoo, Six months from now, it might be profitable again. You can bring it back into your inventory. Absolutely. Yep, there is always going to be somebody willing to make less money than you. Uh, yeah, you, can, sadly. you can take that one to the bank. <laughs> sadly, sadly. Thank you so much again, Kat. No problem. Um, so here's what's happening. We are we're coming to the uh, the. 90 minute mark and you've got lots of questions which I absolutely want to get answered but let me get through uh, the rest of what I have for you some of you have been waiting for three days to hear uh, what I have for you so we're gonna do that uh, and then I promise we will come back and answer some more questions um, so as you know I, I am a big fan of eBay and I just wanted to spell something right now right here eBay's changing, lots of stuff going on. Uh, I think it's going to be for the better. Let me just put that right out there. Um, in a nutshell, eBay, PayPal are splitting. But even bigger than that for eBay sellers is the fact that eBay marketplaces and eBay enterprises are splitting. And that's not getting a whole lot of press. That's the big piece for you guys. eBay marketplaces is us eBay Enterprises is those big box retail stores coming in and getting the special deals. eBay Marketplaces is now going to have to stand on its own two feet, so to speak, and that means they're going to have to incentivize and help us as sellers make that happen. So that's actually really exciting news for you guys. So between eBay and Etsy, those are the places you can build your own brand. Those are the places you can grow your niche and your business as big as you want it to be. Those are the places that you can actually see which customers are buying from you and have their contact information so you can eventually move them to your own website selling these items. Amazon, as Kat said, amazing distribution. A point and testing grounds but make no mistake Amazon does not care about you building your brand and you building your store and in fact they will do everything in their power so that people do not know they're buying from you okay so there's little tricks the private labeling like you talked a little bit about you can do that but Amazon's in it for Amazon, and Amazon also sells against you. They are your competition. So it can be a tough place, and I don't want to see you putting your entire business there, and I don't want to see you putting your entire business on eBay. You have to find the balance. And most of all, 
I want you guys to be excited about your business. I don't want you to wake up in the morning with dread that you're having to, oh, God, I got a list, you know, again today. I, hey, I get it. I get it. And some days it's like, oh. You know, somebody give me a defect or a neg, and it's like this feeling of dread, and that just breaks my heart because being in your own business should be fun. It should be exciting. It should be empowering because you don't have a boss, and if eBay is feeling like your boss, then we got to fix that because they're not. <laughs> they don't even care if you succeed. The only one that really cares if you succeed that, that matters is you. So you have to do what you need to do for your business. Uh, and again, you know, you've heard me kind of talk about it for three days, is doing something that you love, that is your passion, dealing with things that, you know, you're interested in, that you want to learn more about, dealing with things that you know something about, or, you know, at least you have... Like, if I was to do something techie, it's like it would boggle my brain. That is not my talent. I, I could not sell iPads, okay? I just, having to even deal with that would just, I don't care how much money there is in it. You put a passion and a talent together with market demand, and you have all the success you could ever hope for. And there's no limits. That is just the absolutely amazing thing about being in this business. We have no barriers. There's no barriers except the ones we give ourselves. Okay? Sometimes, you know, we have to work a little harder at certain areas or we have to build a little slower. But really, we all have that same opportunity to get where we want to go. And that is what I'm all about. That is what I started the Danny app for uh, because it just brings me no greater joy than to see you guys succeed and to get those big sales and get the ka-chings going off. I just absolutely adore that. And that is why I have developed the Day with Dannys. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. And that is where a small group of us, I don't take big groups, I take small groups. That way everybody gets the one-on-one -on -one attention with their business. And we go out, and depending on the group, you know, if everybody is wanting to dive into Amazon selling, then well, then we go do retail arbitrage. If you all are wanting to really explore uh, expanding into higher profit vintage items, we go to an antique mall. We definitely go to thrift stores. It wouldn't be a day with Danny without thrift stores. Uh, but no matter where you're selling, that day is about finding the merchandise that's going to make you the most money. And I don't buy anything on those days. I don't shop for myself. It's all for you guys. And, yes, we do eBay and Amazon on the same day. Absolutely. And um, this year, I'm doing something a little different. Um, we are going to do two days. We are going to do one day is, of course, the sourcing part of it. But then the piece that I found missing, and here's just some of the groups that I've had fun shopping with before. The piece that was missing uh, was that I would find out six months later um, some of them did not get those items listed yet. And I'm not going to call any names. <laughs> but that is no good. I don't want to be a contributor to e-hoarding. So I decided to add a second day onto the Day with Danny tours this year for those that needed help getting the items researched, priced, and listed. So virtually what's going to happen is we shop one day and the next day it gets listed and you can start realizing back profits on your investment within 48 hours. Uh, so you can go to daywithdanny.com and I have uh, some of the cities uh, listed there. It's not a complete list, you guys, because here's the deal. As soon as I have interest in a city, I start the marketing to find at least five people who are interested in this. That's all it takes. Five people in a city, and I will be there. I don't care how rural you are. If you've got five people in a meetup group somewhere, I will be there. 
And because you guys have spent three days listening to me talk, um, I have a bonus that is just for you guys. Oh, yeah, on the second day, on the, the classroom style day, if you didn't buy anything on the sourcing day, you can absolutely bring things um, that you have in your unlisted inventory or things that are causing you a headache, and we will get those things listed. Okay? So here's what you do. You go over to daywithdanny.com, and you have an option. If you can only just go on the sourcing you can purchase just the one day. If you can only do the classroom style or only want to do the classroom style, you can do those a la carte. And what I'm throwing in for you guys that just anybody who goes to the website is not going to get this. You are going to get a coaching session with Don Ralston to help with your decluttering. That doesn't even have a price, you guys. That is priceless, let me tell you. You're also going to get Robert Bagley, who you heard um, on the first day, you're going to get a copy of his, it's an audio ebook, so you can hear his story of how he left a six-figure job to sell on Amazon and eBay full-time, and he is throwing in a coaching session for you, okay? You're going to get the ultimate guide to savings by store that Kat and I wrote together, it's the PDF form, not the actual book, um, that is a $30 value, we're going to throw that in. But here is the creme de la creme. If you get the two-day, this is only for the two-day package, guys, you are going to get a comp ticket to the More Fun Bigger Profits event that I am holding here in Vegas on May 13th, 14th, and 15th. That is a $297 ticket right there. And those of you, I know I'm already getting, some of you are already registered for that event. If you are already registered for More Fun, Bigger Profits, you are going to get 300 Danny dollars. Now, if you weren't at the event last year, let me tell you about Danny dollars. Um, Danny dollars work like cash at the event. And we have an auction. And you will get to spend those Danny dollars at the auction. So uh, they work just like money at the event. So um, that's it, you guys. I, I am excited to get more people on the track to building their niches and making more money. And I promise this is an investment that you will see back in a short time if you do the work. Uh, that is my guarantee. I don't want to leave anybody with things that are not listed and not selling and not making money. No, here's the thing, and this is something I've done differently. You don't sign up for a specific city. Once I see someone signed up for a city, bam, we're on it. We're making it happen. Um, I have a team that works on that. You know, if people were not on this call today, now, if they sign up, they don't get all these bonuses. This is just for you guys. Um, but we will bring them in and make sure that we have five in a city. And the reason it has to be five for a city is to cover the cost for me to come out. I have to, you know, get on an airplane and, and get a hotel room and all that good stuff. So it, it's strictly about having enough people to cover the cost for me to go out. But I love doing this. I love going to places maybe you hadn't thought about shopping. Um, def there's places that I'm absolutely definitely coming um, that are on the list already over there. Let's see, we've got, of course, uh, I, I have uh, three or four California locations. I have family in California, so I'm out, I, I can get to California pretty easy. Uh, we are going to do Denver. We are going to do uh, Phoenix. We are going to do Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, uh, Orlando, uh, Chicago. I'm going out to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I've got Nashville on the list. Uh, we're going to Raleigh, North Carolina. Carolyn, I'm not, oh, oh, I, you know what? Carolyn, absolutely we can do Salt Lake City. You bet. We can add Salt Lake City to that list. Absolutely. So. So there's a list over there that shows some, and of course Las Vegas, you know, of course Las Vegas. 
Um, Joe, absolutely talk to me after this. We can, we can make that happen. Um, yes, Boston. I will be in Boston and Philadelphia. I'm actually going to be adding some more cities to the East Coast end. Um, I just haven't, I'm waiting to see where the, the interest is and, you know, the first ones that sign up for a city, that's the first place I'm working on. So as you sign up, you will get a form that's going to ask you what city you're interested in. Um, I will be doing, uh, let's see, I'm doing Anaheim, California, and um, Lomita, California, and Sacramento, and San Francisco. Um, Linda, Santa Barbara is a definite possibility. That's where my roots are. I love Santa Barbara. I kind of grew up in the thrift stores of Carpinteria. So I could definitely, definitely be talked into going to Santa Barbara. So for you to get the bonuses included with this three-day workshop that you guys have been here for, um, I'm going to hold this open for the weekend. Because there are there are people who um, are getting the replay that did register, um, they're going to be allowed to get in on this as well. Uh, then I'm going to close it down on Monday. I guess everybody the weekend to jump in, um, and then I really set the the first cities in motion to start getting out there and get them on the calendar and get you guys making some big bucks. All right, so. As I promised, we can go back and take a couple more questions, if you like. Um, questions about the day with Danny's, uh, questions about, you know, Amazon. I can bring Kat back on. Um, oh, oh, that reminds me. So there are several of these cities that I'll be going to um, where I'll be bringing in some special um, guests with me, um, people like Robert Bagley and Kat and um, Dawn, so uh, that's definitely, I'm always looking for some added value for you guys because I think there's uh, some amazing knowledge out there and I want to have you guys tapped into as much of it as possible. Okay. Oh, my bad, so the code you need to use, and if you already purchased and didn't use this code, um, and don't worry, I'll see the time frame. But if you, it does not change the price. The, the price is either $97 for the one day. So if you pick one or the other of the days, it is $97. If you do the two-day package, which gets you the ticket for the More Fun, Bigger Profits event, then you are going to uh, pay $179. And that's it. That's okay. If you didn't know there was a code, I'll go back and, and make sure you're, you're noted as being in on the bonus offer. That was my bad. 99. I'm sorry. I'm so used to, you know, 97. It is 99. The code is bonus. I know. Really complex, isn't it? The code is bonus. All right. So any questions that you'd like us to go back and address. And remember, you know, this can keep going over on the Facebook group too. We can keep asking questions. Um, niche question. Is it more profitable to have a really tight niche, like just jeans, or is it okay to be a bit more broad, a theme, preppy people? So, Linda, because I know where you're going with this, the tighter you can get your niche, the easier it's going to be to attract your ideal customer. And as you attract your ideal customer, the more of those you get in, every customer that comes in the door has a greater likelihood of buying. So the tighter you can make the niche, the more you're going to appeal to every single customer that you attract into the doors. Does that make sense? So I would say jeans is a pretty that's a pretty good niche. If I go if I'm looking for a pair of jeans and I really want to go find a pair of jeans and know I'm going to find a pair of jeans, I want to go to a store that has just jeans. And I'm there, I know I'm going to pay a little bit more, but man, I'm going to find what I need. So that's how niche works. 
you know, you don't want to, like I said, you don't want to go into the Mercedes dealers and be sold a Volkswagen. You want to go and have the greatest selection to choose from to come away with what it is you went in there for. Good, okay. So it's really about knowing how your target customer is shopping. So um, Linda asked, does the preppy person think of going to buy preppy stuff? Do they? Probably not. They just have a certain style in their mind. So you need to know, number one, where are they shopping already? What are their preferred retail stores? And then kind of look at what those big retail stores are doing for marketing. Um, commercials, you know, my husband thinks I'm crazy. We have a DVR, but I watch commercials. And I would encourage you guys, watch commercials. Because commercials have to work really hard nowadays to get the attention of people, to get the attention of their ideal market. So watch commercials and start thinking in your mind, who are they targeting? And if it appeals to you, think about why it appealed to you. What emotion did that strike on and what made you really think about going and buying? Let's, so let's stay on jeans. You guys remember the Calvin Klein commercials? You know, little, okay, I'm going to really date myself here. Brooke Shields and her Calvin Klein commercials. <laughs> Nobody gets between me and a pair of my Calvins, you know, something like that. They were not going for a middle-aged woman target. I will tell you that right now, right? They were going for a young girl who wanted to feel sexy and desirable in her designer jeans. It was about the way those jeans would make her feel as a woman, right, as a girl. Uh, so it always is about some sort of emotion. How many items should be in your store for the niche to get a steady stream of income? I found everyone's advice works. Um, 500 items. So 500 is a, is a nice number of items. But really, if you're niched, you know, I, I like the nice round 100 item. I think that gives the person the feel that you are a solid place that's going to have some new merchandise when they come back. It's not a fly-by-night store. So 100 items to get you going in a niche, and I'm talking about 100 items that all fit together. And 500, yeah, you're, you're really looking at, now I have about 800 items in my store. Um, and that's not as tightly niched as some of my other stores where I only have about 100. So it's just really going to depend on the niche and how tight the niche is. Uh, the tighter the niche, actually, the less the items you need for that steady income. Uh, as Robert said even the other day, you know, um, two or 300 SKUs was netting him 30, 40, 50K a month on Amazon. So if you have the right things, you don't need as many of them. Some of you remember Calvin Klein commercials. Yep, yep. Oh, absolutely, magazines, print magazines. So think about what magazines your ideal customer is buying. Get those magazines and look at the ads and look at the words and look at the articles and look how they're appealing to that target market. You put that emotion in your listings with the pictures, the the styles of the items, and your, it mostly comes down to marketing, but your titles and your descriptions can really fill that emotional need, uh, but it really comes down to your marketing. You know, blogging, social media, wherever you're putting ads out there. Um, Amazon, shipping question, how do I print a label on Amazon and still get a discount like on eBay? Is that done through PayPal? And, you know, um, that's a good question. Kat, do you know the answer to that one? Um, Suzanne, you really can print straight through Amazon. It's easier and faster. I don't know how much your discount is worth on PayPal, but you'd have to get into the PayPal multi-order shipping, and I believe you can Google that link. Uh, then you'd have to go back to Amazon and paste in the tracking number. I would try and see how much time versus money I save each way. Awesome. Um, great question, Jennifer. For your formula, 
um, for if you want to make a certain amount per month, how much in sales you have to post. Um, so I think you're referring to my, my three times formula. Uh, and by the way, if anybody needs a little kick to get their listing done, we're going to be starting the Ultimate Listing Challenge back up in April. I didn't even mention that through this whole thing. Um, UltimateListingChallenge.com. We start back up April 1st, and we go for the full month of April every day, giving you a little kick to get those listings done. But my formula, and this is, and this is general, so this is going to vary depending on what you sell and your price point and things. But for the most part, this works. Say I want to sell $2,000 worth of stuff a month, list 6,000. So triple that. Whatever that amount is, list triple. So that should net you about a 30% sell-through. Now, the better your niche, the better your sell-through is going to be because everything you list is going to attract customers to the stuff you already listed. So, but it, it, that three times rule works really, really consistently well. Um, had a question, do you have to be a professional seller on Amazon to use FBA? Kat, I don't, I don't believe that's the case, is it? No, it's not. You used, no, it's not. It used to be, but it is not that true anymore. That's what I thought, yeah. Uh, is one SKU number used on one item with multiples, like 10 sandals? Do they all have the same SKU? Yes, if they're all exactly the same. They have the same skew. Well, actually, I like something like sandals. If they're different sizes, they can still have the same skew. Am I correct on that one, or is there, are they different skews? Yeah, if they're all the same, it's one skew, and you can have ten of the same pair of sandals. But if they're different colors or different sizes, and okay. each individual one would have a different skew. Got it. Yep. That's, all right. Oh my goodness, we are we are just not going to get into flat files. <laughs> I am not the flat <laughs> file person. That is Karen Locker. <laughs> I gave a shout out to Karen earlier, so I'm sure they'd like to hear from you that what she does. Yeah, and I was asked uh, yesterday or yesterday on one of those days what I use to get ungated in my categories, and I will tell you, I went straight to Karen Locker Solutions for E-commerce.com. Um, got it done in 24 hours. Now I don't know if it's always that fast. She is phenomenal and has a proven track record of getting that done. So if you want to sell clothing or shoes or watches or jewelry or oh, luggage, those gated categories, Karen Jagal. So you guys, we are, we are almost 30 minutes over um, where we were supposed to be with this. And um, I don't want to take up any more of your day. I am happy to answer questions over on the Danny app Facebook group. If you're over there um, monitoring for those questions to come in, be sure you tag me, um, and we can do follow-up over there. It is my wish, you guys, that you get the answers that you need to be hugely successful, and no matter what success means for you, it may not mean a six-figure sales business for you. Not everybody wants that, and you know what? There is no shame in that, but it is my desire that you reach where you want to be and that you're not stressed out and worrying about slow sales and that you know you don't know how you're going to pay your eBay fees next month. So that is what I'm all about is helping you guys have a very very comfortable business where things are selling and you're having fun doing it. And with that, go be profitable and make it fun. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. This has been just an absolute pleasure to bring this to you. Bye-bye.